it's a pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Vincent Haukrad. He's studying computer science in Erlangen. He's doing his master with a focus on IT security. But the work he is presenting us now, he actually completed before during uh, an assistant position beforehand. And it is about insecurity of app-based TAN authentication in online banking. Give us a welcome you know, applause for Vincent, please. Welcome from my side. Uh, my name is Vincent Haupert. Last autumn, uh, my colleague and I had a look at the security of app-based TAN authentication. Maybe one of you has already heard about it on Heise two weeks ago. I got a call from the, a German bank institution. Mr. Meyer, as I want to call him now, asked me what he's doing, what I'm doing between Christmas and New Year. He actually wanted to know if uh, his uh, PR department actually needs to get ready for a new attack or... <laughs> and he just... Vincent Claire says that um, he uh, he hopes that the, the bank already has a, a template drafted up. It makes it easier for next time it happens. But online banking is so established these days that it affects us all. A special property of it is that in the time between its creation in the 80s and now, it turned into a two-factor authentication procedure. You usually have a username and password and a TAN. Um, mostly the TAN, the TAN procedure was uh, modified for security reasons. It usually works this way. For completeness sakes, I want to draft it up here. Uh, you log into the, the portal, you use your username and password, you uh, create a transaction, and in the second step you have to verify it with uh, a ton. Usually it used to be uh, an old system where you had a list on paper. The new system or newer is with uh, using a phone, but this is also leaky or insecure as we found. And then there's also the special hardware devices that are pretty commonplace. This last one is actually already pretty safe, but if you believe the banking institution, then there is a pressing need in the population to always and everywhere be able to execute your transactions. So let's have a show of hands who at the moment is doing an online transaction. So if you want to do it everywhere, of course, you don't want to have an extra device that you have to carry with you. So what they did is they discovered a device that everyone ha always has with them, and it's called the smartphone. And it's of course, it's secure. Okay, now you only have one device instead of two, and therefore you only have a one-factor procedure in result. So what happens is you use your banking app on the smartphone, use your username and password, uh, create a wire transfer, and then you have to switch to the TAN app and instead of just using the paper, you go to the TAN app and most, com uh, most banking companies in Germany are already a big fan and apply this kind of system. The ones that haven't are pretty sure already working on it so they can catch up. One or two in the guys in the row in front of me are already worried, but let's uh, detail how the actual attack would look like. Well, we already know that malware in the official app stores for the mobile systems is in the fiction. Um, on my own uh, chair at university, there's a guy called Dominic Meyer, 
and he showed that the Google Play Store just can effectively protect against malware. Uh, the, the idea was to bring some 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 malware to the to the Google App Store, and it was his bachelor thesis, and he told his tutor, yeah, that he was ready already. So it was really quick. And that was in 2014, by the way. Um, and what he did was, he, he he zipped a root exploit. Well, he just zipped it and he uploaded it. There was no password, nothing, uh, nothing else. Just uploaded it. But that's not only gr theory. Uh, at the same time, we made this this app. There was the there was the app brain test. Um, that had about 100, 100, 500,000 downloads. This app actually did what what the what the theory might be to the mobile 10, 10 area, um, and it hacks the software and just relates on the on the on the hardware. Um, uh, I I chose the Sparkasse for this example because it's my bank and is one of the first companies to offer this. So we try to see what can you actually do and how can you attack it. Well, the first thing you could you could copy the app, or you could reverse engineer the protocol. But that's pretty pretty much concentrated on the Tan app. Um, the, the problem is itself of the ten ten area was a two factor authentication. Um, you could man manip manipulate the transaction, so we manipulate the transaction the user the user makes uh, in real time. So how did we do this? How was the scenario we thought about? Uh, on the left, you can see the Sparkasse app. Uh, you use it to log in into your online banking and to to fill in uh, the transaction file, and this goes to the Sparkassen server, and that sends sends an, sends a, sends a message to the to the actual app, and um, so they they are requested to change to the Estan app, um, and to tr to transfer it to the Sparkasse app. And it's so so much automated that you actually ask yourself why you have two apps for this. What we do uh, before, after after filling in the information on the Sparkasse app, um, we manip manipulate the data, and we change the address, we change the amount, and the Sparkasse sends sends the same details to the Tan app, and then shows it there. And before showing it there, we mani manipulate it to the original data so the user can't see this and just just says okay, and uh, yeah, and accepts the payment. Um, what are the security measures for this? So the Sparkassen app is is pretty easy on this, so it doesn't really have security me measures. You have a root. You, you, you can see if you are the root on the device. On the other side, the Estan app um, tries to tries to to use more measures than one to to keep itself safe from uh, from malware. But all these measures, you know, even the Sparkasse is not sure about all these measures and if they are really working. They have a root uh, root detection. Um, if if root is not available, the app the app just quits. Um, it's a static analysis, by the way, and it's TÜV approved. It's German quality. <laughs> so, from from this mark on, you know, we we were pretty pretty amazed. But then we see what the actual security measures are. So we found out. The Sparkasse isn't so sure about their own security measures, so they they bought something from Proman. They made a they made a native Bible, uh, library, the so-called Proman Shield. And the library is is of course encoded, and is obfuscated with a special key. 
Um, so you can't just patch out the library. Yeah, just take it out. They took strings from, from the Java logic, logics uh, and pushes it into the library. The app itself sets static fields with strings or they, or they have an index. So that that makes it difficult to just get pull down the library from the from the app. Um, it detects root, debuggers, repackaging, but it doesn't really handle it. So that's the reason is they want to sell a library that works with any software, so that's not personalized on this app. Well, so this is how it's implemented. There's there's callbacks in the Java code for the events, for example, debuggers or root. The app itself implements the interface, and if it detects it, it's, uh, it calls the code. So on the button, there's a routing status. Um, it's in the parameter Z, and it checks if it's rooted or not. And then it quits just, you know, if you have the, don't have the root status. If this event comes, uh, the methods end and the app runs. It's it's a paradox because this app doesn't have a status. It just delivers strings, even if even if root is already detected. I didn't think it was so easy. Yeah. So we look at we look at the transaction itself. So at first you have the login window with a with a name and a password and you also have have the information that the device is rooted by the way and in this case i made a transaction to to the tax payment place and uh, on the next place we we, ma we manipulated the data in the background and you can't really see it and you are asked to change to push tan so you can put the push into uh, the tan into the actual app so we do this with our password again in the in the, in the push tan app and it's highly likely that it's the same password than in this Sparkassen app and then we look at the transaction details it's 10 cent so this might be the iban whatever and yeah it looks good to my yeah tan to Sparkasse. And then we just remember the last two digits of the transaction number, and you can you, you can set the, the the transaction. But if we look into our transaction details, um, there's there's a different different amount of money a on a transaction to the tax payments. So anyone who knows the story knows what comes later. So this is the statement from the Sparkasse. Well, it's an old version, yeah, that shouldn't work anymore. So there's a new version since 16 October, 16th October in a Google Play Store. It's not possible anymore. So, well, it's nothing new for us. Uh, the Sparkasse didn't really read it carefully. So we already said that in the current version, the kind of way the attack works. It works differently in the new app, but we can still do it with a little more work. So let's see how the new app works. <laughs> in order to uh, drive an attack against the new version, first have to think about what's different this time. Well, at Promon or maybe the bank, they realized that it doesn't really make sense what they did so far. Therefore, they don't use Java callbacks anymore, but rather just crash the app if uh, they detect root or debugger or whatever. And then they open a page in the browser and therefore you, you can't just uh, circumvent the root detection anymore that way, or at least it easily. So what we did is we used Exposed in order for a proof of concept, and that doesn't work anymore. So that's bad, but 
transition to kernel? In order to still make it work, we first have to circumvent root detection and the exposed detection. So how does it work? So far, I did pretty well with the approach of just thinking about how I would do it. So what they, what I would do is I would just look through the file system with uh, characteristic things. So, and it turns out, yeah, that's what they did. They look for SPID SU. So what you do is you rename uh, these programs in the file system that this uh, these characteristic files that the app is looking for, and suddenly it works again. But that's annoying because obviously you still want stuff for the other apps to work, and if you rename it, then it doesn't work anymore. So what? So what happens is you usually don't just uh, run the uh, the command and not uh, use the full path, but rather just the command name because it uses the path expansion. So what you did is you changed the path and it still works everywhere and the app just doesn't realize it anymore. <laughs> Perfect. Like it's a little more paradox now because the, the actual app recognizes this but uh, the Promon library doesn't. So you still get the warning in the app, even though it now doesn't crash anymore. So how does the exposed detection work? Well, same approach. What would I would do? Probably they just look for something characteristic that is uh, unique for exposed, and this list shows you what they're looking for. So we now have to get rid of this somehow, and it still has to work. The first four you can just delete or rename or whatever. You don't need them. So that's easy. And the other three are a little more tricky because you actually use them. But let's just rename them. And you obviously have to resolve the dependency among them. But it's not enough. So this is actually working a little better than I expected. So they actually look in the in the executable and look for the string exposed. And then they determine that if, if they find this string, then it obviously it's installed. But so I just recompile it and it works. That's it. Yeah. Um, so let's do a demo. Same approach. We open the app, we enter our password. This time, we actually look at the specific version of the app. So here, I can show you, this is the version from the 7th of December. That's the most recent one until two hours ago. So let's enter our wire transfer, not to the the tax collectors, but rather to the library of my university. I actually have to pay a fine. <laughs> my bank account isn't filled, as you can see, so I had to use something small. But okay, here you can see the push time app is already opened up. So the integration actually was increased. So here you can see again the free euro I want to transfer. And let's have a look at the version again of the push ten app. So yeah, this is also the latest version. So yeah, the data is correct. Ten is correct. Everything's okay. So let's just confirm. So we go back to the original app. Yeah, the transfer was received. And if you now look into the details of the transaction. So I already <laughs> paid for some Christmas shopping. And here is the 4 year 20 instead of the 3 year that I actually was confirming. So yeah, it still works.
Ce moment. So, well, <laughs> and it also has, has a different, different info line. So, so I'm a little quicker than I thought. So we have more time for questions. Um, what can you say about app-based TAN, uh, TAN transactions? It's pretty, pretty weak. Um, the callbacks are a little more difficult to, to hack. So you can't can't just have root, but it's it's still still a game that Sparkas and other distributors will lose at some point. The root detection, for example, usually usually causes hassle for the users because it has false positives at some points. So you have to ask yourself if this transaction method is still good for them. But uh, what I actually did was quite weird. You know, I actually circumvented stuff that a normal user does. So it didn't really didn't really prevent a real attack. Someone who's actually who's actually uh rooting its his own machine um has really much different uh, difficulties and a normal user won't install a binary somewhere. Um Root isn't isn't set for this for this hack. In this case, it would have been easy enough to to use a root exploit, um, and then you also don't have the hassle with the root detection. And I still have a, have a few slides here, and I want to thank you for your attention. Vielen vielen Dank, Vincent. Thanks a lot, Vincent. Great talk. So, and we now have time for questions. Macht euch bitte kenntlich. So, if you're online, please write in the IRC. Vor dem Mikrofon. Guys in the room, just go to the microphone. Minus 2 und 4 sind an. Ich sehe schon jemand am Mikro 2? Nein, du stehst da nur so. Okay. Wir geben euch mal noch ein paar Minuten Zeit zum Überlegen. Und ich gucke mal nach oben. Lieber Mensch, der du Fragen aus dem Netz einsammelst, ich sehe dich gerade nicht. Aber vorlesen. Dann mache ich das einfach mal. Shelter Aid wollen wir. Shelter Aid wants to know. Are there also weaknesses in the optic tan procedures? So with photo tan, you mean uh, with with this tan kind of you mind photo tan qr tan and photo tan is pretty pretty similar um you scan a code and then you get a tan but that's the different differentiates from from the device you can't really use it on one device of course you can use you you can scan the qr with your own device but it's a little different here and there's a lot of more weaknesses there so you can copy the app but that's not comparable to the scenario we had with the mobile TAN systems. You described how the app is actually harnessed, hardening itself against debugging. How exactly did you find the transaction details and how did you manipulate them so that you could transfer them to the bank? The problem is that there are only measure measurements on the analysis basis, so you can't really really shoot an attack. The attack itself uh, was made in post. That's a special framework that hooks JavaScript. Um, for the proof of concept, this was easy enough. So most measures that are documented here can't can't really save yourself from a real attack because they usually just only only f so the Sparkasse can say well yeah this attack doesn't work anymore um, I'm interested in well you showed how the app scans against exposed 
That looks pretty ridiculous. Can you do this in a proper way that actually would work, or is this without hope? Yeah, that's a little difficult to make it properly. You, ha you had to have, you, you need to have trustworthy requests, and wh who's allowed to, to be in my call stack? So that's a little difficult, and I don't have an idea right now to, how to make it more efficient or to to, to efficiently prevent it. Thanks for the demonstration. I was actually really delighted to see that the distribution into two apps actually doesn't give you anything as an added value. What's your estimation that is it possible in the future to have apps of an authentication mechanism in Android that actually do what they should after rooting? Or this looks like a m saner approach than what they tried so far. It's that's really deep into what what you are told about. But there's a secure world and an insecure insecure world. There's a trust zone in RRM that's not used in Android. Samsung has something like Knox that's similar, but you have to buy it, and you don't know how how long it might take on Android. So it will take a while, I guess. We can deduce from your explanations that there is a fundamental problem with the combination of two apps on the same device that it actually renders the two-factor authentication useless and the security can only improve by using two separate devices that have to be compromised different uh, yeah medicine. that's what i was talking about and i have a quote on this by the way it's not what i'm only talking about even in the buffin journal uh the ton shouldn't be on the same smartphone uh, what that they use for online banking if someone hacks your smartphone he can use both methods that's well really clever, you know, you get it to the point. Some people wanted to know, maybe this has already been answered, but if you have two different procedures, maybe app and PC, if it's secure then. Well, it still have the same problems like QR and photo tan, but it's still quite safe if I use this tan method on my computer. It's not worse than SMS tan, for example. It's comparable. Well, this seems relatively new from my own experience. I know that that when you use mobile 10 with my device then I'm not allowed to use start the transaction from the same device so they actually filtered mobile uh, host names and then the vendor that created the software that they actually released the same app under a different logo that so I, I can only deduce that they know that it's crap. So I have a different quote here. That's the Masi is, is the internet standard for, for internet payments. Um, the time is over right now, so you have you, you have to have strong strong customer authorization. But you can interpret everything into this here. So it has a Q&A that's longer than the actual text of this information. Um, and after that, uh, app-based security measurements and the actual online banking have to be on different machines. So it's actually questionable whether this uh, method is supposed to be allowed to live. Um, May I ask how you do wire transfers or what do you recommend? 
I use strip tan and I actually use it on my mobile device but usually just when I'm longer somewhere you know I don't really have the need to make transactions where wherever I am um, I actually can can say chip tan is really good thanks a lot he actually promised to stay here if you have some questions so just walk up to him and chat him up you guys have been listening to the translation